in verse 17 and 18 that God not only made him, but God also thinks about him. Now, we could, we could personalize this as David does in this psalm and say, God, God made me, that's amazing. But God thinks about me, that's almost unbelievable. I want to continue today in Psalm 139, in verse 17 and 18. The entire psalm has been given a few different titles by those who, who wrote about the psalm. Uh, one writer called this psalm, The Mysterious Man and the Mighty God. Because while this psalm is all about God, it is David here that reflects upon uh, God's actions and God's uh, thoughts and God's love toward him. We saw a few weeks ago in verse 14 of Psalm 139, where David says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. There's this instinctive reaction of, of praise, not skepticism, not, not criticism, but awe and worship. This, this, is how, this is how believers respond to the creative handiwork of God. What David said is echoed in heaven in Revelation 4.11, the, the heavenly throng cry, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and by your will, by God's sheer purpose and determination, by, by an act of will, they exist and were created. And David moves from this thought of the creativity of God, the, the handiwork of God that, God, that God made him, to an equally marvelous thought in verse 17 and 18, that God not only made him, but God also thinks about him. Now, we could, we could personalize this as David does in this psalm and say, God, God made me, that's amazing. But God thinks about me, that's almost unbelievable. It, it, it's one thing to consider that God has, has made, and you know, even those that don't necessarily believe in God believe there is some purpose to this universe. There's, there, 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 there's something there. Even, it's, even if it's some sort of divine being that, that, that began things and then moved on to another universe. Maybe he's busy somewhere else, but there's a lot of purpose and design in this world. As, as believers, we know better. And David says in verse 17, How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. You might have some precious things at home. Some precious gifts. Some, some precious articles that have been passed down through the family. When we think about precious things, we think about valuable jewellery and glassware. But the preciousness that David writes about are God's thoughts toward him. It's the most precious thing we have. It's, it's the greatest thing we have that, that God made us and he thinks about us favorably, lovingly, positively. Now, I, I, I get that, I, I can understand that God would think about all of you, but, but me, I'm not so sure about. I, I, I get that God would think about others favorably, but me, that's another story. Maybe you feel the same way as well. Now, this isn't the first time in the Psalms that that David talks about God thinking about him. Now we realize that God is an eternal being. He is the ever-present reality. And does he need to think? Yeah? Does he need to process anything? That's, that's another question. But the Bible assures us that we are on the mind of God and in the heart of God. The Bible assures us of that. 
Uh, David says earlier in Psalm 40, verse 5, many are, many are Lord my God, are your wonderful works, which you have done, and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. We couldn't, we couldn't give them back to you. We couldn't count them and, and, and sum them all up and, and try and repeat them back to your eternal mind. David finishes the verse with, if I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Whether you think you're a numbers person or not, whether you're good at maths, whether, whether, you, whether you've got a, a great calculator available, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We can't calculate God's thoughts to us. Is, is, it, is this an exaggeration? But why wouldn't an infinite God who has no limits, has no limits, have infinite thoughts towards those he has stamped his image on. An infinite God has infinite thoughts. Now, put this on our level. Many of us have had the blessing of bringing, I'll say it, that first child home, that first one, that gets all of our attention, all of our thoughts. I mean, our obsession, <laughs> our obsession. That first one. We, we, we're just happy to watch them sleep. We're just happy to just to, just to see them, you know, com compute things for, for, for the first time. Um, we, 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 we get obsessed with our little babies. And, and really our children are never, never far from our minds. There are, there are professions, there, there are nurses and carers who's, who, who are paid to, 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 to think about and to plan on and to focus on maybe just one person. Just one person there to look after. And, and, and while ever they're on shift, that person's welfare and where that person is and how, and how they're sitting or how they're lying down and have they had enough food or drink, that, that is their total occupation. Well, God can do abundantly more than that. God has an infinite ability now, this isn't just sentimental. This isn't God having these syrupy thoughts toward us. These are active thoughts. They're active. And they're more than just emotion. And it would be good for us if you could just keep a bookmark there in Psalm 139 and, and turn over to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29, and, and again, this is a familiar scripture, a familiar scripture in verse 10 of Jeremiah 29. You have a well-known prophecy, well-known prophecy. Let me just read from 10 down to verse 14. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at, at Babylon, and these are not 70 pleasant years. These are going to be 70 years of captivity, all thoroughly deserved. Thoroughly deserved. Prophet after prophet after prophet get ignored. God says, you've gone after idols, you haven't repented. You're, you, you, you're going into captivity. You've got to learn the lesson. You're going to be my people. No more idols. No more idols. This is going to be a two-generation captivity. Seventy years. He says, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you. There's going to be some bright news. Bright news. How would you feel going into captivity at year one? Knowing that my grandson, my granddaughter are going to get the benefit of this, of this prophecy. That's very hard. It's very hard. But that's what it was. That's what it was. He said, I'm going to cause you to return to this place. And then he says in verse 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. David says, we can't count them. We can't count them. God says, I know them. And every last one. Well, what are those thoughts? What are they? Thoughts of peace and not of evil. 
to give you a future and a hope. Even, even in God sending his people away into captivity, the long game is their peace and their blessing. Not their temporal comfort, but the long-term peace and prosperity of his own covenant people. And then he says in verse 12, then you'll call upon me. He knows what they're going to do. And go and pray to me and, and, and I'll listen to you. I'll listen to you. I'm going to answer you. And you'll seek me and find me. And when you search me with all of your heart, I wonder, have you done that today? Have you sought God with all of your heart? You know, the first time a person does that is when they become a Christian. When they come to an end of themselves and they say, say, God, save me because of what Jesus did on the cross for me. I, I'm, I'm just going to seek you, put my trust in you, my self-confidence is done. Have you sought him like that? And if you're a Christian, do you keep seeking him? And verse 14 says, I will be found by you. God's not hiding, he's not running. He's not running. He's waiting. The miracle is that God can be found despite our sin. That's the miracle, friends, that God can be found by any of us despite what we have done. I'll be found by you, says the Lord. I'll bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I've driven you, says the Lord. And I'll bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive and when God thinks about his people in that sense there's thoughts but there's also action action God's foreknowledge is not a bare future awareness that doesn't that doesn't do justice to what the Bible says is God's foreknowledge it involves his plans it involves his purposes and his ultimate triumph of his will but then if you just turn over a couple more chapters in, in Jeremiah 31 before you return to Psalm 139, just two verses, two verses in Jeremiah 31, verse number 27 and 28. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and the seed of beast. There's going to be a united kingdom and there's going to be a lot of prosperity. And then look at verse 28. It shall come to pass that as I have watched over them to pluck up, to break down, to throw down, to destroy and to afflict, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. Though they're in captivity for 70 years, they're never out of God's heart, never out of his mind. Look, they're out of the land. They're out of, they're out of some of the blessings, but they're never out of God's mind and God's heart and God's reach. Matthew Henry said that God's omniscience, that he knows all, which might justly have watched over us to do us hurt. God could have been watching over to really hurt has been employed for us and has watched over us to do us good. That's, what, that's the Christian's hope, that our Father has good plans. Now, with that in mind, let's go back to uh, Psalm 139. Wow, message is half over. It's half over, half done. Verse 18, verse 18. He says, he says, if I should count them, if I should count them, which he can't, which you can't, they are more in number than the sand. When I am awake, I am still with you. Now, you and I realize that even, even just a little part of one beach, just, just 100 meters of one beach line, how many grains of sand is there? Now, realize we tend to put them back in the car, do we not? You know, when we come home after even a walk along the beach. But even just a tiny strip of, of a beach line, 
Only God knows the number of that tiny little representative strip of sand. It says, I've read that the average person thinks between 12 to 60,000 thoughts per day. 12 to 60,000 thoughts. What if it was just that? I mean, if, if God thought about you 60,000 times, would that be enough? I think that'd be enough for me. I'd take, I'd take, I'd take two or three, yeah? I'd take, I'd take a few. 60,000, but that, 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 that's nothing compared to the grains of sand on one strip of beach, on one strip. And the problem is that if I tried to tell you about how many grains of sand there are, as one university did, as one university did back in 2012, University of Hawaii, they have nothing better to do in Hawaii than <laughs> do research studies on grains of sand on the earth. But they're meaningless terms. It's meaningless. They, they found that the earth has, has roughly, so they can only guess, they're guessing too, has 7.5 times 10 to the power of 18. I have no clue what that means. <laughs> Grain of sand. Or, to clarify things, 7 quintillion 500 quadrillion grains. Well, that clarifies everything, doesn't it? <laughs> that, that's all very clear. And so, and so basically, uh, the scientists are saying we have no clue. They, they could be wrong. <laughs> there could be a few more zeros. We are finite creatures. Finite creatures. You know, David began this psalm. David began this psalm talking about how God knew his thoughts. David's thoughts are far off. God, you know, what, you know what's on my mind before it's, it's even on my mind. You know what I'm going to think about in a few days' time. You know all about that, but, but your thoughts toward me, I can't even begin to imagine what and how many they are. God's thoughts are greater. They are ordered, loving, powerful, thoughtful. They are productive. Think about how much we tend to worry about things. Our concerns, our problems, and, and they may be many today. There may be many. If we spent a fraction of that time thinking about the truth that, that God thinks and plans on our behalf. You see, we can think and worry about our problems, but God is at work too. God's at work too. He's, he's thinking about them as well in a sense because he is thinking about us. If, if, we, if we spent that fraction of time pondering God's thoughts about us, God's thoughts about us, things would have to change. Things would have to change. Look at how verse 18 finishes. He says in verse 18, When I awake... I am still with you. Is he talking about tomorrow morning? Or is he talking about the eternal morning? Yeah? When, when, when we really wake up. Yeah? Either fits. Because his thoughts are infinite. Whether it's the resurrection morning. Whether it's tomorrow morning. Either way. When we awake... He is still with us. You see, earlier in chapter, earlier in one, Psalm 139, David talks about God making him in the womb. God makes him in the womb. From, from the womb till his tomb. From the beginning to the end. From dust to dust. God is going to be there. He'll meet us there, in fact. So if God makes him in the womb 
then he's going to care for him throughout his earthly life. Let me read just again from Psalm 40, this time verse 17. is a beautiful thought. David says, I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. Are you poor and needy today? Well, you have a God who's thinking about you, poor and needy. Are you crushed? God thinks about you. And then David says, you are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. That's the kind of God that we can rely upon. Think about Mary when she is uh, carrying Jesus. All that's going on in the mind. Right? Think about the burden of that. The burden of that, carrying Messiah into the world. And God has chosen this girl, you. That, that's a burden. That's a burden. Mary said in Luke 1 that, that, that he has regarded the lowly estate of his maid servant. He thought about me. He considered me. He chose me. He's given me this task and this responsibility. She says, he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. Psalm 139 has also been titled the perceiving, pursuing and planning God. God's always perceiving, he's always pursuing and he's always planning we most of the time are powerless about everything around us. Generally, not a lot we can do, but that's not God's world. That's not God. He's our perceiving, pursuing, and planning God is your faith and trust in him today.